Good evening, Judge Weiner. Good evening, Chief Justice. Um, if you so mind that, uh, uh, feel free to take off the, the mask. <laughs> Are you well? Very well, thank you. Um, please accept our apologies for keeping you waiting until now. We're really sorry. It's okay, I'm used to the grave, graveyard shift. <laughs> Tell me, um, for how many years have you been on the bench now? Uh, it will be 11 in July. And, um, okay, all right. And uh, <clears throat> how many terms did you, did you um, say, did you act in the, in the, at the Supreme Court of Appeal for? Um, I've acted there, I think for seven terms. Okay, just in your own ways, tell us uh, just how ready you are and why you should not be left out of uh, uh, the list of those to be recommended for appointment. Well, um, I started off at the bar at the age of 24 because I couldn't get articles at that time, although I applied to 42 firms. Um, they all wanted to know when I was gonna get married and have children. Um, so I then went straight to the bar where I practiced as um, a junior counsel for 18 years and then I was a silk for 15 years. So I was at the bar for 33 years. Um, I believe that I will bring a lot of experience to the, the SCA um, I have dealt with virtually every kind of matter possible, both in my practice and while I was on, on the bench. I began acting, in fact, in 1995, and I acted every two to three years for a period of time. So I gained a lot of experience on the bench as an acting judge in the um, Gauteng, well, it was then the... the Transvaal Provincial Division, it's now the Gauteng Local Division. Um, so I have had a lot of experience in various aspects of the law. In fact, most of the ones that we deal with um, in the SCA, I have dealt with um, as a silk at the bar. Um, I also went through and understand the gender issues that permeate the um, the, the profession as a whole. I was just looking at some stats and, and to date, there are only, the bar consists of 30% females. And with the SCA, since 1991, when Leonora van den Heerfer first served, there have only been 14 female judges out of 55. So, I understand those sorts of issues. I believe that I bring, a, um, as I said, experience in various aspects of the law. I've done, um, I'm an accredited arbitrator and mediator, and I've used those mediation skills, in fact, in case management um, meeting, meetings that we have in our division and settled the cases uh, before they even have to go to trial. Um, my practice at the beginning consisted mainly of pro bono work and pro deo work, which I did for many years, because there were only six women at the bar at that time, um, out of, I think, 250 men. And it took quite a while for me to work through all of those issues, being recognized. I did not want to only do family law, as is what happens with women at the bar. So I... I was a pioneer, I think. I um, strived endlessly for the rights of women and blacks juniors when they joined the bar. Um, I have always worked towards um, racial and gender um, equality. It's been a, a, a real passion of mine throughout my career. And I believe that I would bring that sort of um, 
experience and those sorts of issues um, to, to the SCA. I'm also very proactive in the sense that, um, as the JP will, will hopefully concur, I changed the, or suggested to the JP that there were certain aspects of the practice manual that had to be changed. For instance, dealing with evictions and foreclosures when there was no personal service, people were being evicted, having their homes taken away when several, um, where there were just no rules being followed. And we formulated a totally different um, practice in regard to foreclosures and evictions. Um, and it formed the par part of the, um, the uh, practice manual, which then the rules board adopted and now appears as rule 46A. I also launched the pro bono office at the Johannesburg High Court in collaboration with the JP. Um, and it serves for people who appear in court who don't have legal representation and um, they can go down to that pro bono office. So basically I feel that I have worked hard as a female. It took me a long time at the bar to succeed. Um, as I said, there were only um, um, six women when I went to the bar. And I believe that I have been very, um, hopefully influential in, in attracting other females that came to the bar and um, I'm very interested in training, as you would have seen from my application. I was the convener of the advocacy training committee uh, for the general council of the bar for 10 years. I developed many programs. Um, I've done uh, judicial training as well, both um, at the, the high court and um, for aspirant judges, both on uh, Judge Schwartzman's program and uh, Judge Matopo. And um, I continue to this day to, to do advocacy training for juniors at the bar, for middle, middle juniors and for, for senior uh, members of the bar. And I'm really passionate about the training and the building up of skills um, that will help in our courts. Colleagues, may I have uh, a list of those who would like to put questions to Judge Wainer, please? Go, go. Madam Zella. Bofo. Lucas. Singh. Thank you. Uh, President, over to you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good evening, uh, Where am Judge Wainer. She, no, I'm not there. Look, look at the screen. <laughs> I didn't see you there. Good evening, President. I've been asked to limit my questions, so I'll ask you only one. You are 67 years old, although one just can't tell by looking at you. You look so good. Should that be a bar to your appointment, your age, that is? Well, I think that it's all part of the diversity and inclusion debate. And what has happened is that um, age has become the one issue that no one pays any attention to in regard to discrimination. Um, so I believe that I will bring to the, um, to the bench, although I only have five years left, um, I have the experience and as a, as a mother and grandmother, and um, I have the compassion and maturity and candor, and I believe the wisdom that comes with age. My age is um, now, also the, the fact that I'm only applying now is, as you know, um, I first acted in the, in the SCA in 2019, and unfortunately uh, there was no um, vacancies advertised in 2019. And then last year was COVID, so I'm two years older than I, than I would have been then. I do believe that in the five years that I have left, I can contribute a lot. Um, I, am, I do have the feelings of a, of a mentor, and I'd like to help out. I've done the uh, 
judges training, diversity training, and I've already helped out colleagues in the SCA who are acting and who have come to me with um, certain issues. And it's interesting because um, only last month, the United Kingdom has changed the retirement age for judges to 75. So one should hope that it would follow through because aging is, is really just a state of mind. Um, and I think that the intergenerational collaboration that would occur from having a diversity across age, uh, gender, uh, race is a way in which the judiciary can be strengthened. So I hope that in those uh, five years, um, I would be able to contribute um, both in the sense of uh, my judgeship and also in the sense of um, assisting um, acting judges and um, anyone else who, who needed my assistance. And one must just realize that um, age seems to be the final frontier of discrimination, which um, is also unconstitutional. Um, and, you know, one has to look only at people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who sat until she was 86 and wrote the most scholarly judgments. Um, <laughs> her dissents were fantastic and led to a lot of um, legislation being changed. So, um, and we have um, actually an example in our court because last year, I think, no, in 2019, Justice Lordlaw was 67 when he was appointed. So I believe that I can bring both um, age in, in respect of wisdom and experience, as well as um, the gender issue, because there are still um, gender issues in, in the transformation of the judiciary. Thank you, Judge Rina. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, President. Uh, Commissioner Sigogo. Thank you, CJ. Um, good evening. Good and evening. How are you? Fine, and you? My, my question as well is on, on your age. Yes. Um, and uh, <coughs> maybe uh, on a different perspective. Sorry, um, just could you repeat that? On a different perspective. Yes. Uh, taking into account that um, uh, if you are appointed and you are to leave uh, very soon uh, because of your age, um, the, this commission will be forced again to sit and consider another person. And another aspect would be, um, we, we believe when you go to the SCA, your, your salary will be increased. And when you go to retirement, you will go, you, you will go to retirement with a new salary and um, you will have worked for, for this new salary, which will take you to retirement for about three or even if uh, less than three years. No, uh, I'll work still for another five years. I have five years left to retirement. Oh, okay, so for, for, for this five years, so. Yes, um, and I've think, acted for two, so. Do you think um, seven years. That, that that will make a financial sense, um, uh, taking into account our struggling economy for now? Well, I suppose that's a good question. If um, if there, I was going for one or two years, but there are five years. I mean, you people have all been sitting up for two days. That's long. Imagine how long five years is. I <laughs> mean, um, I think I can achieve a lot in five years. I think um, that five years is actually a lengthy period of time. And it will also make room for a younger, less ex maybe less experienced judge to come through at that point um, after I've served my five years. It's, it's the uh, mandatory retirement age, as I say, and I would certainly be willing to work on later than that because I don't believe that um, my um, contribution is only limited to those five years. At the moment, that's the mandatory um, age for retirement but perhaps we'll follow the UK uh, way and extend the mandatory retirement age to 75, or even um, let judges sit 
some for life as they do in the USA, but I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a good thing at all. I think there does come a time when one needs to uh, retire and step aside, leaving room for others to then fill out our places. CJ, thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I can't resist the temptation, Judge Weiner. A colleague of mine in the US told me of a judge in the Ninth Circuit Court who is uh, 99. He puts a question to counsel, he gets an answer and says, who, who asked you that question? <laughs> so, being, a judge, being a judge for life could be problematic. I reach that um, stage yet. Ad <laughs> advocate my no, I, I, my only question was on age as well. I mean, it has been covered fully by both the president and my friend, uh, my, the commissioner, Mr. Skogo. Except to mention that, uh, uh, Judge Weiner, you have really uh, to note that and, con and confirm that you've really contributed a lot in child advocacy. I was there all the time throughout all the programs, and we'd like to thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Chief Justice, I've just got a small follow up on this age question yes sir yes please go ahead jp thank you uh, judge winner there's a view that in the judiciary in particular the older the judge gets the more resourceful and productive they they are what's your response to that i agree with that um if i look in our division for instance um the the older judges contribute an enormous amount they do a lot of the training, the lecturing. Um, they, they have got the experience that is, ta it takes a long time to get the sort of experience where you feel comfortable dealing with virtually every sort of case. You also feel comfortable if there is something unusual in a case in going to another colleague. Whereas when you're very young, you don't want to appear stupid. So you don't want to go and ask colleagues about certain things. But I have absolutely no qualms, both in um, the Joburg court and in the SEA. If something is complicated or I'm struggling with something, I will go and ask a colleague for assistance. And I think that's something that comes with age and, and wisdom and... Okay, thank you, Judge Wiener. Thank you, thank you CJ. Thank you, JP. Uh, Advocate Mbofu. Thank you. Good evening, Josh. Good evening, Commissioner Pumpo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, you'll be happy to know I'm not going to ask you about age. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> the, what I really want to highlight is, is this. I mean, you and I have known each other for a long time. 26 years ago, we traveled to London to be trained in advocacy skills. Um, and we were the guinea pigs, the first group of people to be trained in, uh, and then we had to come here and train other advocates and yes. judges and so on yes. in things like the art of cross-examination and other skills. Now, the, you've been involved in that work since that, literally since that since time. Since 1996, since yes. 19, and it was January 1996. Yes. I know this because Bafana Bafana were playing their first game in Afcon, yeah, <laughs> which I missed. Well, I went to the final in that yes, <laughs> so But um, the, 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 I just want you to talk about the, the contribution that you have made personally. And, I, you know, it's a lot of sacrifice uh, in, transform, in transforming the lives of uh, young advocates um, and uh, old ones for that matter. Um, it, you know, in, in that particular field. But the more pointed question is whether in your 11 years as a judge, you've been able to effectively see the fruits of your labor in, in, in enhanced advocacy skills from the bar, uh, as it were, uh, and whether you are able to recognize the, the, the quality changes. And also whether the, that experience of um, advocacy training has assisted you as a judge, not just observing others. Uh, and uh, I said, I'm not going to talk to you about age, but I am now, which is that I just want to say, knowing the kind of training that you've had, and I've, I'm just 
amazed that the, you know, one of the key things is preparation uh, of how well prepared you were on this question of age. It's, <laughs> it's clear that you are anticipating it and you've made very good points, including the fact of uh, actually pointing out that it is actually one of the, the uh, criteria for discrimination. Yesterday we were saying here that section 1742 of the constitution does, only talks about race and gender. And I think you, you rightly say that there could be other factors uh, yes. for diversity on the bench. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... so your your <laughs> observations on the bench? Oh, on the bench, yes. Of, of, the, um, of the advocates first and whether it has assisted you. Um, I have definitely noticed uh, a difference. You can actually see when someone's been for advocacy training and when they haven't. I mean, all pupils have to be trained. So we've trained pupils for the last 20, 20 odd years and have seen those pupils. And then they come to, we've got advocacy training junkies, if I can call them that. that. They come to the first pupillage workshop and they can't wait for the next one, which is for baby juniors. Then there's one for middle juniors. Then there's one expert workshops and they just keep go going and just keep coming to these workshops. And it has been simply amazing for me to look at the development of these young people who have turned their lives around literally because they arrived absolutely um, green and have devoted themselves. And a lot of those who we've trained over the years are now advocacy teachers because we've trained them to become teachers and they then train the younger pupils as well. Um, so I have seen a, a, a big difference. And it makes an enormous difference as a judge when you have excellent um, counsel in front of you who've prepared well, who've done proper heads of argument, who are asking the right questions in leading a witness and asking the right questions in um, cross-examination, such as, they must never say in cross-examination, I put it to you. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I, I'm very proud of and passionate about the advocacy training that, um, that I've instilled. I did, for 10 years, I was the convener for the GCB and I, I did um, develop many, many programs for pupils, juniors and experts. Um, I went to many workshops overseas um, at my own expense and um, brought back some of the teachings and have involved um, many colleagues that you have met as well, Mr. Mpofu, um, from the English bar, the Hong Kong bar, um, Malaysia, Australia, Ireland, um, Zimbabwe. So we've, we've also trained around the continent. Um, we've trained in um, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Lesotho, um, and we've had Kenyan judges here at our workshops. So it is, it is an incredible group of people who are advocacy trainers, because we all do it for nothing. Um, and just for the love of the profession and the love of excellence in the profession. So it's one of the things that when I started, when I started doing advocacy training, it suddenly became a real passion for me because as you know, as an advocate, we literally live in mortal combat every single day. We're fighting someone all of the time. Um, and with advocacy training, we're actually encouraging and creating excellence and not seeing people being brought down. We're seeing them being lifted and rising. So it's been, it's been one of the most satisfying um, parts of my career. Well. Thank you for all that work. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senior Counsel. Honorable Lucas. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Yes. Good evening, uh, Justice Wanda. Good evening, Commissioner. I think um, I, I don't want even to speak about your age, just to say that you are well preserved. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say, wine and cheese get much better with Something age. Something like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, the issue that I wanted to raise is to say that with your age, your wisdom and experience, 
the issue of mentoring, I think, is something that become very important. Sorry, just repeat that. The issue of mentoring. Mentoring, yes. And I, and you have raised it, and even the fact that we can, I can see that from from time back, even in your write ups, that really there is activism in making sure that you empower women and young women in particular. So yes. I have been consistent uh, asking candidates this, uh, around these issues and particularly around the gender divide and so, because I must say that, and it's not deliberate that I ask the women or the female candidates, because I must say one of the male candidates yesterday in fact, I was quite impressed with his compassion for yes. the fact that we need to really develop our women because like you have the stats that you have raised is even a confirmation of what we've been speaking about. Yes. So I want to just to comment you on the work that you are doing. And I really think that you still have a lot to offer. It's just that I, I don't think it, it, if I reach that age, I would still be so active the way you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. If I can perhaps just um, answer that and also to say that I am very involved um, with gender-based violence um, activities. I've given a lot of webinars on it. Um, and we've, um, there, there needs to be cooperation between the police, between um, the lawyers, between judges, and I strongly believe that there should be sensitive, gender sensitivity training for judges and magistrates, because the way in which um, victims are made to go through secondary victimization in courts is simply unacceptable. And it's one of the things that I have um, suggested. In fact, I'm in contact with, and I'm going to speak to Sajay about it, um, the trainers who are at um, Women and Men Against Child Abuse, and they run training courses for um, people who have to deal with these sort of things. And it has to be a combined effort between the police forces, between the judiciary, and the prosecutors. And I believe it's really essential if we're going to tackle gender-based violence at all. Honorable Singh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice, and good evening, Judge Weiner. Good evening. I, I see there has been a lot of reference to age uh, <laughs> in the questions that various commissioners have asked you. I just hope President Maya uh, will pass the same compliment to me that she passed to you, because I'm born in the same year as you. So let's leave that aside. <laughs> uh, I just want to ask you with regard to judgments that have been successfully appealed. You've listed four. Yes. Are there more judgments that have been successfully appealed? And how did you react to these judgments that were appealed successfully? Um, there, so far, as far as I'm aware, there are only these four. Um, I think that Judge Wallace was in three of them. <laughs> so I, I reacted in the way they were, they were quite seriously complicated matters. The first one was about section uh, 5.3 of the Admiralty Jurisdiction Regulation Act. Now in Johannesburg, we don't deal with maritime law. So this was a, a special case where they were dealing with security for costs, which is why it came in front of our court. Um, the, the appeal really went on whether the onus was discharged on a certain issue. I said it had been, the appeal court said it hadn't. Um, in fact, there was um, Judge uh, van der Merwe uh, dissented on that matter, and I congratulated him on his dissent. <laughs> then there was the Faria case, which um, was, that was quite complicated because there, it was an RAF matter where there'd been a joint minute by the experts agreeing that general damages were payable. On the day of the trial, the RAF um, objected to the RAF 4 form, saying that um, they, were, they were not accepting it. And at that stage, um, the, the Duma case had just come out, which said that basically the, um, the RAF can object up until the last minute. But what had never been decided was what happens when experts have signed a joint minute when they agree. 
I found that having done that, the RAF couldn't come at the last minute and say they, um, they are, now, are now objecting. Um, so what the court found was that neither in Duma nor in another case had, uh, was the fact that there was a joint minute prepared by experts from both sides um, agreeing. And so they, but they did found, find that the RAF could take as much time as it liked. But this led to the um, regulations being revised and that in terms of the revised regulation, the RAF is given 90 days within which to, there was no period before, it was given 90 days within which to accept the serious injury case. Um, then there was Benhouse Mining, which was a, a tax case. Um, I found one way, um, the justices of the, the Supreme Court of Appeal found another, as there hadn't been a proof in, in terms of section 367C of the act. Um, it was just after I was coming for my first appointment and when I met Judge Davis and I said to him, very nice way to welcome me by overruling my judgment. And he said, sometimes judges go wrong. So I said, which judge, you or me? But, <laughs> and then there's the last one, the state versus McQuenna, where there had been non-compliance with, with um, a certain provision of the uh, Criminal Procedure Act. And I referred the matter, I found that there was non-compliance, but that referred the matter back to the same magistrate. And I was overruled on that point that it should have gone to a different magistrate. So those are the four cases as far as I'm aware. Thank you very much. I'm very glad that you take these appeals in the spirit, so the upholding of these appeals in the spirit in which is intended. Absolutely. My second question, yeah. My second question relates to these allegations uh, by a, a newspaper uh, where the JSC was involved in the spokesperson. Can you just lead us a bit into that? Uh, you're talking about the, the Raymond Chalum um, case. Well, yes. in that case, um, there was a, um, a headline, in fact, in the Sunday Independent one Sunday saying, the judiciary is corrupt. Um, the informant to the, or, to the um, journalists was Raymond Chalum, who had tried to become a judge who came before this, this body, I think in 2013, he was rejected and he then started accusing both the JSE and various judges of being biased and um, corrupt. Um, he, he then, so that was their, that was their source. Um, I, I might say that Mr. Chalem has now been struck off the role of, of attorneys inter alia for these statements. Um, he, he spoke of various judges. My, the, my um, incident was he had come before me in a defamation case and the other side pleaded qualified privilege because the defamatory remarks had been made in affidavits in the court in correspondence with the um, Supreme Court of Appeal, correspondence with the Constitutional Court, because he kept taking these matters on appeal. It went on for about five or six years. They, they came in front of me, he, well, he came in front of me, and the other side was taking the point of, of qualified privilege. Mr. Chalam walked in with documents from the floor up there and wanted me to read each and every document to see the defamation that had been committed against him. The other side argued that um, the qualified privilege, if that succeeded, then that was the end of the matter. So I then decided, I said, I will hear the qualified privilege issue. If I find that it's not a situation of qualified privilege, I will hear all the evidence. I found that it was a, a qualified privilege matter and I dismissed the claim. And I wrote a judgment on it, which the Sunday Independent didn't look at, so they didn't actually know what had happened. Um, it's not so much that he accused me of um, corruption, because, but he basically said that I'd taken the file 
and that I didn't refuse to listen to him and I therefore shouldn't be a judge because I don't listen to, to parties. You know, the letter was written. I, I, I spoke directly immediately to Justice Malambo. And in fact, I was acting in the Supreme Court of Appeal at the time. So I spoke to uh, President Meyer. And a formal complaint was made with the press on board by um, the JSE um, spokesperson, Ms. Nubi. And everything was set out in the formal complaint. The response was that the IOL, that's the Sunday Independent, et cetera, had withdrawn from the press council and therefore there was nothing that the press on board could do. I took advice from certain of my colleagues, including the JP and Justice Meyer, President Meyer um, and other judges and as to whether I should sue for defamation and they all just advised me to step back from it, don't get involved in this sort of thing and um, that very soon it would be discovered that Mr. Challam actually had certain challenges. Um, and I, I, I adhere to that advice and subsequently he was struck off the roll. So that's the incident um, that I refer to in my application. <clears throat> thank you very much for clearing that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Judge Warner, and thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Singh. Uh, Judge Warner, thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, our apologies, and you are excused, man. Thank you so much. CJ, should we take into account that she supports Liverpool? <laughs> Terrible. That Wrong a team that's going to go against her. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> the JP and I have these conversations. He supports Arsenal. I support Liverpool. We're both having a shocking season. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge.